This is India Today Podcasts. There have been two times when I have significantly improved my health. The first time was around the age of 24 when I knocked off about 15 kilos in a year. The second was last year when I shed around 6 kilos, but I also managed to improve my blood sugar, my thyroid function, and my estrogen progesterone balance, all of which had taken a severe beating during the pandemic. I look back and I see my approach to both these two experiences were very different. The first time I did what I did through sheer will power. I ate one meal a day. But my second attempt at reclaiming my health, I found results not through denial of food, but through a celebration and embrace of great food. This is Sonali Acharji and you are listening to Health Wealth, a podcast that wants to help you find doable solutions and motivation when it comes to looking after yourself. I see life as an investment. It's a bit like the stock market. You never know what each choice will get you, but you can weigh the odds. I don't know whether having an optimum weight, exercise and not smoking will keep me healthy longer, but I do know some things. If I'm obese, I won't be able to bend down to pick my dog. That excess fat will put pressure on my spine and hips and knees. It will coat my organs and because I have a predisposition to diabetes, I would start having blood sugar problems. Diabetes in turn will definitely stop my body from processing the energy needed to live in the way I am biologically made to. I will be spending 5 to 10,000 rupees a month on medicine and doctors. I won't be able to have cheat days to have a cookie or a cupcake, and I know that obesity, diabetes, smoking are all a stepping stone for various other metabolic or organ issues. And so I chose. I chose to invest in what has more probable benefits, a healthy kitchen. When I left my mother's house and I began to build my own from scratch, I actually started from the kitchen outwards. I didn't have a coffee table, I didn't have a dining table, no washing machine, no bookshelves for the first one year. And my husband helped me with some clever math and we realized if you buy good quality utensils, the best most reliable spices, in the short run you might feel the pinch on your wallet, but they pay off in other ways. Firstly, they last longer. Like the turmeric in my house comes from Meghalaya and it's so strong. I just need a pinch. It lasts a year. So even if I spend double buying it, it comes to the same amount as cheaper turmeric in a year's time. Now you might ask what's wrong with cheap turmeric? Why do you need to get the good stuff? Well, when I actually got the good stuff, I realized my god, turmeric has a flavor and it's different than what I'm used to. So I didn't need to make my food taste great by masking it with tons of butter, cream, ghee, sugar or meat. The expense also paid off in the satisfaction I get from the food and the fact that I don't feel the craving for ordering in. And the same goes for my utensils. Good quality ones, they last longer but they also save time. Look, I'm a full-time working person with two dogs, two guinea pigs, six very finicky zebra fish. I have an aging mother a sizable marital family i do pottery knitting crochet and piano classes where do i find the time slow cooking i have this beautiful stone manipuri pot where i just dump in the dal and water and i can forget about it for hours i do something else and the dal comes out so great i don't even spend too much time chopping i don't need to put a lot for garnish so that 3500 rupee tiny pot paid for itself in the number of hours it has saved me This is where I got the idea to do this episode to change how we see cooking and food. We often believe healthy food to be boring. We think cooking at home is time consuming. We pay high prices for food that don't taste great and then sit with the guilt of added calories. We read all this internet news on what to eat and that just adds to all the stress. And most importantly, it creates a gap between us and food and it doesn't have to be this way. the healthiest i have ever been is now and i owe it to my kitchen my kitchen has taught me to have the most sustainable relationship with food 
to help you do the same. I have with me today Michelin star chef Suvir Saran. He's written a lovely book called Indian Home Cooking, which anyone starting out should really take a look at. And he also knows a lot about being healthy because he's the only chef on the nutrition advisory board at Harvard Medical School. Hi, Suvir. Hi, how are you? I'm great. I'm so glad we finally get to do this. So, Sonali, thank you for having me. I was listening to you in your opening uh, remarks. And I am smitten. I'm proud to be on your show. And I'm excited to be challenged by somebody who's lived this uh, conundrum that we face over time and health. And thank you for you choosing time invested in cooking as your medicine for better health. You've done the right choice. You made the best choice. It is. So tell me, you're so busy. It's taken me almost a month to have you here. With all these commitments, I wanted to know, do you still cook for yourself? I don't practice what I preach as often as I should. But I must tell you, I eat mostly very well. I'm uh, perhaps mostly vegetarian. I was born in a vegetarian household, which remains vegetarian even now. When I go out to restaurants and I order looking at a menu, I order only vegetarian. When I'm cooking to train my teams, when I'm uh, reviewing a restaurant and seeing what their chops are, I eat everything on their menu. I'm what perhaps the Japanese call Buddhist vegetarian. You put meat in front of me, I'll eat it and show gratitude. But if I'm hungry, I eat vegetables. So that's my story. But I recently, I have very bad joints because I'm that rare Indian chef who doesn't cook with brown masala, red masala, yellow masala, all the crappy (laughs) masalas that have made Indian food both popular and an abomination in the world of cuisine. So I don't have that crap in my kitchen. I cook from beginning to end, every dish, every day at my restaurants. We don't cook with masalas that are pre-made for months in advance. So I've ruined both my shoulders. I've had reconstruction surgeries, a six and a half plus hour surgery on my right shoulder, four hour surgery on my left shoulder. And they both now need surgery okay. again. I tell you this because that's the investment I put behind cooking. But I recently had to go get an MRI done because my arms have given up. I need full new arms and that technology hasn't uh, crept up with the need of my arms. So I'm in pain every day. Mm-hmm. The doctor in Bombay said, can I do another test on you, Mr. Saran? You're 51 year old. Can we check your calcium, uh, uh, heart calcium levels? Your, you know, the arteries get calcification mm-hmm. from bad eating. Yeah. The score yeah. of zero to five. I was at zero. So what I eat has kept my arteries yes. clean. I have no plaque buildup at 51. I'm good to go for three years without the fear of a heart attack. So you are what you eat. The choices you make totally define what you are inside. You can have a chunky body. You may not be able to pick up your dog with your hands, but you live longer than a person who's sculpted and eating crap. And chances are, if you're a bodybuilder yeah. living in India, You'll die by 35, 40 out of kidney failure, heart attacks, because you're consuming protein uh, powders, whey protein, and all kinds of processed rubbish that only harms you while you have a bodybuilder's body. So the Mediterranean diet, which the world is following quite desperately to be healthy, is quite similar to the Indian diet. They had olive oil, we have mustard oil, we have sesame oil, we have peanut oil. And when you're using mostly plant-based clear oils and eating vegetables, grains, legumes, beans and lentils, as Indians have done forever, with a little bit of dairy thrown in for satiety and pleasure, tripti and satisfaction, you're doing the best thing you can. You're copying the Mediterranean diet and perhaps even more sensibly because you're not using as much chicken or fish as they do. So animal protein is not the best protein in the planet because it comes with saturated fat that clogs your arteries. So the Indian, old Indian way, which we Indians have lost, is the best way to eat on the planet. And the only reason I sit on the Nutrition Advisory Board of Brigham and Women Hospital, the teaching arm of Harvard Medical School, because they don't want my uh, good looks, which I don't have. They want the intelligence of the old Indian kitchens where uh, vegetables, plants, legumes, beans, grains, were all celebrated daily with just a lot of love poured into the act of cooking, where we sat at the table together to eat, where we kvetched yeah. and talked yeah. what was ailing us, where we healed one another through conversations, where every mealtime was a communion yeah. with friends, family and loved ones. That's my philosophy of cooking. And I try to do that. Even if I'm not cooking, I go to places where food is 
honest, simple, delicious, mostly plant-based, and always shared with love and care. So I saw this study in um, the journal, it's called PNAS, and it said that it's quite possible that the surge in our brain size about 1.8 million years ago is due to the fact that humans began to cook. So cooking could actually be one of the reasons you and I are here today. And I wanted to know, how did you start cooking? What what drove you into the kitchen? You know, the earliest memories, relatives, uh, loved ones, neighbors, people who know me, have of me, are either asking them to teach me how to cook or teaching them how to cook. When I was five or six year old, an uh, uh, in-law of uh, uh, my, my parent, my father's cousin got married. And the lady he married was trying to make a chapati. And it wasn't, it was ragged. It looked like the map of India, not a full circle. And I offered to bake the roti for her so she wouldn't get uh, laughed at during the Mudikhai ceremony. So I was six year old teaching somebody how to cook a chapati. But my earliest memories, going back to my earliest days on this earth, are of my grandmother waking up in the morning, lighting the light of the flame of the gas to cook a dish, a chapati or two, to be fed to a bird, to be fed to a cow, to be fed to a squirrel. And then they would take it to nature and the, but my grandmother would tell me the powers that be above. And what she taught me was uh, sharing, caring, and paying attention to what we do. It wasn't about religion. It was about a ritual, a family tradition, and a moment to pause and connect with nature, that these creatures, big and small, that surround the world with us, whose lives we have taken over, whose earth we have consumed. We have to honor them, give them back a little for having stolen so much from them. Yeah. And in the act of that, also con continue our traditions of ritualistic prayer, which she didn't believe in. But she taught me how food was worship, and worship was a continuum of being one with the planet. Very Vedantic. Mm -hmm. That it was Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that we were one world, yeah. one people, one village, and all together. And our footsteps in the kitchen were important because you are what you eat. And so I learned how to cook from Panditji, our Brahmin cook, who cooked with Navedyam, with Vaishnav practices in the holy kitchen of our home where everybody entered only if they were uh, freshly showered and without any leather on their person. And so it was mostly nobody. And uh, the food was cooked for the gods before they were served to us. And that food was always vegetarian. I was fascinated by the dogma, the ritual that Panditji performed with Dadi aboard. But in the end, the deliciousness of the meal was amazing. And Panditji loved me and I found in the kitchen an escape from the harrowing, uh, the brain that I uh, was blessed with, which thought I was an aberration because I was a gay man. I was an aberration because I knitted as a man. I was an aberration because I did crochet. Mm -hmm. I was an aberration because I did uh, made, uh, you know, the uh, costumes for the Laddu Gopal. So I did everything a man wasn't supposed to do. And Panditji encouraged me to do it. My mother did. My grandma did. They didn't care about labels. So food was part and parcel of my growing up years. And the kitchen was that safe cave where I wasn't judged. I wasn't teased. I wasn't questioned where I could be one with the world and feed people deliciousness that I could see on their faces. They did the happy dance and Panditji served the meals. And in my little small way, by peeling a cucumber or see, helping him chop it very slowly, I had been part of that incredible moment where people's faces and their bodies would dance with tripti, satiety, happiness, and joyful yeah. memories. And I loved cooking for that reason. So you said something which um, it really struck out just now. You, you talked about the kitchen being a safe space and a place that you weren't judged. And I think it's so important that we save our kitchens from cancel culture. You know, I've read statements that are like, if you as a woman are cooking and working, that means you're not a feminist. Or, you know, I, I think the opposite is equally dangerous, you know, making someone feel bad if they don't know how to cook or if they're cooking differently, because that 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 flow of cooking is so beautiful, you know. Um, if you get, bring right and wrong into in very harsh terms into a kitchen and you bring shame into the kitchen, you're going to lose so many people um, who are already cooking and you're going to discourage so many people who might want to cook. So if you had to encourage someone to start cooking, what would be the best way? How do you think you can introduce them to the joys of the kitchen? I came to America at the age of 20 to study graphic design and art history at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. 
I grew up in a vegetarian home when I would go to weddings and large parties and homes of non-vegetarian family and friends. I was a tough kid because I was so connected to Panditji, our Brahmin cook. Even though the family would eat, I would never eat food outside. I would tell people I'm full. I would say, family ka even though I was from the boy's side, I would say, Ladki, tu kisi ki hai na, main nahi khana. I wasn't eating because I didn't trust that it was clean food. And here I arrive in America, a land that loved eating meat. And what did I do? I was eating, I was cooking food for people who loved to eat meat. And I decided, you know, get over it. Your bhua, my dad's sister, would, had a non-vegetarian husband and she learned how to cook meat without tasting it. So I called my bhua and with her help, I learned the important uh, steps on how to make meat. And I cooked meat for people. I never butchered an animal. I was a, wanted to be a veterinarian. I had a zoo or always in my home in Delhi of animals I had as pets. And here I started cooking meat. Why? Because I wanted to feed people what made them happy. I wanted the mealtime not to be a lecture. I wanted food, uh, the dining table to be a safe haven of just free living, free loving, and free sharing. And so I learned when I my first cookbook came out, Indian Home Cooking, the, uh, there was a healthy living institute in New York that was run by women who were all fascist, vegetarian, Nazi, uh, uh, veganism lovers. They were shocked that Sweet Saran, the vegetarian cook, has put 30% meat recipes in his book. And I said, excuse me, my book is not just for vegans or vegetarians or Indians. My book is for the planet of people who love eating the foods of the Indian home. Yeah. And if you want all vegetarian, I have 70% of the recipes are vegetarian or vegan. 30% have animal meat or cheese or milk. I have no share. Then uh, the uh, uh, Cooking Light magazine called and said, Chef, this book is incredible. We are reviewing it. Did you set about uh, writing a healthy cookbook without saying it is healthy? I said, no, I didn't set about doing anything healthy. I'm cooking the food of the Indian homes, mm -hmm. which is sensible, uh, incredibly nuanced celebration of local, seasonal, regional, mostly plant-based deliciousness that's incomparable to the planet, mm -hmm. anywhere else in the planet. And I said, that food, when you eat, share, and uh, uh, give to others, is a celebration without lectures on how to live, love, and care for one another without drama, fuss, or bad health. Because in the Indian kitchen, whoever's at home helps. If you weren't lucky enough to have staff in the kitchens to cook, yeah. women and men came together, young kids helped their mothers, helped their, there were homes that I went to where the father was cooking. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, whoever cooked, cooking should be an act of sharing. In my New York kitchen, where I was a bottle cleaner, the dishwasher, the chef, the host, as friends would come in, I would invite a couple to come early because they wanted to learn a recipe. I would say, come early. I would help take the help in chopping, prepping, teach them the art of cooking. And others would come in a little later and say, lay the table. A third, I would say, fold the napkins, put them at the table. Another would make a floral arrangement for the center of the table. In the end, we would put the dishes into the dishwasher together. The entire evening was a collaborative effort of connecting, of living, of enjoying food, talking. It wasn't just the act of ingesting. Mm -hmm. It was a dinner. Where conversations, where freedom, where safety of one another's mental health, of our well being, of our dreams and aspirations were all protected collegially by one another. We were doing what in Hindi, the loose term is satsangati. That when you're with yes. like minded people, yeah. you don't have to police one another. You educate one another through your better examples. Mm -hmm. By being uh, kind, you get kindness. By giving love, you enjoy another's love. Do unto others as you want done to you, the golden rule. And I think food should be practiced. The art of eating, the art of cooking should be a very free space where you enjoy one another and each other's nuanced individuality and also learn from each other and giving to the other what they love. Yeah. And be flexible by feeding people some of the best meat they'd ever eaten. I've turned many people mostly vegetarian and some vegan because they understood the power of eating healthy yeah. through the example of my meat cooking, that they trusted me enough to know I'm a good chef. Then they just lost their inhibitions and ate everything I made from karela to zimikan to <laughs> katal. They were willing to try it all because they trusted me. So if you allow people the dignity of respect for their opinions, the chances are they'll believe you more.
in later in life. That, that is such a beautiful way to, you know, go about it because I think that that's so much more powerful than shaming someone. Shame never, never. Really ends up, uh, you know, yielding much. You'll be shamed uh, by another. Yes. Shame is a, and it is a issue today. I mean, I think we, we all have to sort of. And the culture. Out. You said it yeah, perfectly. It is. It is. Um, if you, I mean, if I could be a little specific, I ask you to give me maybe two or three Indian simple recipes, which are also healthy, that somebody who really doesn't know cooking can start with. You know, the easiest uh, Indian recipe that I can give you, if you uh, wanting to eat Indian and want healthy, the most basic thing is dal chawal. Mm-hmm. How do you make it even healthier? Mm-hmm. Make your rice a brown rice, not processed basmati. And uh, let the rice be a lower qu- quantity. Eat more of the dal. What I did in my dals in New York, instead of doing a tarka, just the tarka in the end, I would put my dal, in, I would put oil into my pressure cooker. Mm-hmm. I throw in the khada masala, which are the whole spices, cumin seed, full uh, sabat lal mechi, whole red chilies, maybe sarso mustard seed a little hing, asafoetida. If I now want to become fancier one day, I'll put cloves, cardamom, cinnamon, mace, nutmeg, all of them, bloom them. I begin with cold oil. I learned this from Panditji, that you don't put them in hot oil, they splatter in one second and they don't, you don't coax out the depth of a spice's flavor. Why would Indians do it in the in the hot oil? They didn't have the luxury of having free gas. It was expensive. So you did everything in a rush. So when you begin with cold oil, allow, allow your spices to luxuriate in the bath that goes from cold to warm to hot. They release their flavors very happily, easily and wholly. At that point, you put your onions if you're adding them, ginger, brown them, add garlic if you want to put garlic in that dal, brown it a little further. Now put the dry powders, dhania jeera powder, turmeric powder, now cook those a little. At that last minute, I take my dal after I've picked them all dry. Even if you rinse them, dry them off. Now ro- toast the dal in the oil. Brown them. Mm. The kushbu of the dal comes into the pan. Now put lal mirchi and quickly throw your water. By doing that, you don't lose the color of the lal mirchi powder. Now you pressure cook it away. But what I did was in between the onions and the layer where I put the dry spices, when I'm making a one pot dish, I put all the sabzis and make like a sambar. But the spices decide what the end result will be, what spices I've added or what I've decided to eliminate. That makes the flavor different. Sometimes I put sambar puri instead of the dhanya jeera powder. Mm-hmm. Other times I'll put panch poran as the spice mix, get a Bengali nuanced dal with some subsidies in it. Other times I make a more robust garlicky one with a clove dalchini tejpat and make it more like a panch kuti amrit sari dal and I'll make, put a melange of five different lentils into the pan. So you change it to your mood, change it to who you're entertaining. And by adding those veggies in the pot, in one pot, you've gotten everything you need for good nutrition, for feeling comfort with little brown rice, you can't go wrong. Then you can make khichris. Do you, yeah. you know, it's a one pot magic. My khichri that I make is called birbal ki khichri. It's okay. slow cooking. It has three or four tarkas going into the dish. It takes a slow, if you cook it in a slow cooker or in that pot that you were talking about, earthenware pot, you can cook it over three, four hours. Yeah. And I put two to three additions of veggies that have been cooked in different pans into the kitchen. Okay. It's not a marizno kitchen. It's not a sick person's kitchen. It's a celebration of flavor. Yeah. I put it in bowls, but I make a churi ki chutney. Okay. So with, a, with a, a, a knife, I cut ginger, lemon skin, uh, mint, coriander, and green chilies and make a chutney with a knife. And then I put lemon juice and buna zira powder into this chutney and pour it on top of the uh, bowl of kitchri. Put buna, you know, the crispy uh, uh, fried onions and squeeze a little lemon juice, some more fresh dhania. It's spoonfuls of magic in every bite. At the uh, uh, Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives conference, a joint conference between Harvard School of Public Health and the Culinary Institute of America, when we would give a bowl of this, people would go crazy. And it, when it's tested by nutritionists and dietitians at Harvard, they've never seen a dish healthier than this. It also has a dollop of ghee, and yet it's healthy. That's another example. My father were, died of liver failure. Uh, he had NASH, which is a non-alcoholic steosis hepatitis mm-hmm. that people with diabetes get. 
So he got that and we lost him and he was 65. But one of the dishes he loved eating when he could eat nothing was a big vegetable stir fry, okay. which we began with a tablespoon or two of vegetable oil in which we put, we would put cumin seeds, some whole dried red chilies, a little hing. And once they were uh, jumping in the pan, I would add cabbage, simla mirchi, red, green, yellow, orange, whatever colors you get. We would add uh, some uh, full gobi, cauliflower. We would add green peas and just saute it in an open pan over a good 30, 40 minutes while you are doing something on your iPhone, yeah. while you can be folding your laundry, while you can be answering messages. And every five minutes, stir, fry, just stir the ingredients in the pan. And the edges of the cauliflower, the cabbage starts browning a little. The cauliflower wills. The water from the vegetables evaporates. You get this incredible mixed vegetable that is amazing by itself with some dal and chawal. Or you can break an egg on it and put it back into an oven and stir it. It's incredible. And it's also good by itself with a crunchy. I sometimes keep it crunchy to make it into a coleslaw. So it's all these veggies that are yeah. crispy, crunchy, yeah. little spice, yeah. lemon juice, and you get an incredible crunchy slaw. So again, it depends on your mood. Do you want to go out and eat a slow-cooked meal with deep comfort, you know, flavor that have melded? You want to keep it edgy and make it crunchy and crispy and have a playful meal where it's yeah. really simple and easy and it excites you and you want to dance and take 10 minutes of a music and dance class in your own home. So, you know, it depends yeah. on you. Yeah. No, actually, um, something that, uh, you know, I, I've been realizing is that when you fall in love with cooking, a lot of the processes, like making chutney with a knife, you know, it's just easier to do it in a blender. But those processes become fun on their own, you know. Um, I always say you really have to enjoy it to sit and make ghee, you know, sit and stir the milk for so many hours. But I find it meditative, I find it very soothing to keep stir stirring away, you know. And it's cathartic. All that yeah. anger you have about your boss who's mean and terrible yeah. or that friend who yeah. poked you and you can take it out. It's done. I take it out on bread. I keep punching my bread. That's, that's how my workout oh. goes. And, and you know, cooking is that, that yeah. in the kitchen, you can you can be aggressive or you can be peaceful. Yeah. But the one thing you should always be in life, not just in the kitchen, is mindful. Yeah. And even if you make a mistake, it's yeah. the beginning of a new adventure. It's yeah. a new recipe coming your yeah. way. Yeah. Recipe in life, recipe in cooking, recipe yeah. in what not to do, what not to repeat. Yeah. So there's you can never go wrong in being just there in a kitchen. Because the kitchen is a place where you cook, where you create, where you learn, where you learn to give to others and bring pleasure to yourself and all your loved ones and strangers alike. Yeah. So go be in a kitchen, have fun, and chances are you'll get healing and nutrition and comfort all at once. Yeah. So now I also believe that um, ready-made masalas are not the best and they really don't add much to your food. It doesn't taste that great. And then you start craving biryani outside. Um other than that, are there a few other things which you think are essential for a kitchen to be healthy? So, you know, the first thing we need to have in a kitchen is healthy attitude and the understanding that we're not living in times past. I think the most important thing humans forget to when they are in the search for the authentic, search for the healthy, search for the best that none of it matters if you're being unsustainable in the practices you're trying to promulgate for yourself and others. So you're working, you are alone, you don't have staff in your home, you have many 21st century problems that people before you didn't have to struggle with. So it's okay to have prepackaged spices. They may change a little, but if you made it with love and care, if your brain is functioning, you'll make all the changes needed to match the uh, uh, biryani that you ordered from outside and top it because your brain will tell you what to do better. So never beat yourself for baking, cutting some corners. Even a canned vegetable when rinsed two or three times in running water is perfectly fine. Frozen vegetables are often better than fresh vegetables because they've been plucked in the right season at that correct moment in frozen right there in the plant right next to the farm and brought you in perfect condition with no additives. Don't be ashamed to use them. If anything brings you into the kitchen, to cook fresh food, if those are frozen uh, canned veggies, frozen veggies, a packaged spice, don't beat yours. Where you need to run away are the bad oils, bad fats. Fat is never the enemy. It's that trans fat, dalda, yeah. palm oil, 
It's that coconut oil that's cloudy in a bottle. Mm -hmm. Nobody used to eat coconut oil like putting it in coffee and it, okay. 10 kilos in every ingredient. It's, yeah. It congeals at room temperature. What you need to see is any fat that sitting at room temperature becomes cloudy is going to get cloudy in your heart chamber. Mm -hmm. It's going to clog your arteries. It's common sense. So ghee and coconut oil are flavor enhancers. Use them like that. Use the peanut oil, the sesame oil, the mustard oil, the sunflower oil, the canola oil, the rice bran oil. And then to add a little nuanced flavor, coconut oil, ghee, fine. But uh, the ingredients that you need to have is common sense, a love of self, uh, love of others, uh, love of tradition, uh, practicality, and the idea that I'll do it in a smart way, that I'd keep doing it again and again. There's no point chasing fads, no point chasing trends. No point chasing a diet plan because they are a, 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 just a pathway to breakdown. Because mm -hmm. every year people make them, they break them, they look for another one. We have to be mindful. We have to chase a lifestyle that meets our needs, that suits our uh, place and time in life. We have to be a autochthonous to who we are. If we are happy in our surroundings in this moment in time, with this body, this body shape, with these needs of our work and our children's uh, demands and our pets' needs and our workout schedule. Fit all of it into your life, but keep cooking happening. The more food you eat at home, at your table, prepared by you, the healthier you will be as that's in your control. What you're eating outside, even in fine restaurants, mm -hmm. is not always what it's made out to be. So mm -hmm. cook more at home. Don't be worried of those ingredients you think aren't as fresh as grandma's. Not to worry. Cook yeah. more at home. I've, I've been reading this book. Um, it's called The History of English Food, and it's by a historian called Clarissa Wright. And there's one line in it, you know, I just had to share. It says, modern health pundits seem to have forgotten how many wars were fought and won on a diet of bacon, eggs and white bread. Why is it that we seem to be so scared of some food items now, you know, gluten and dairy. And it's it's actually, even if we don't have intolerance, it's a phobia that's set into everyone's head. What did this do to our eating and cooking experiences, this sort of fear? You know, there are people, there's 1% of the world that's gluten intolerant. Mm -hmm. But you have like every society, a man or woman who's supposedly chic and well-traveled and well-lived, yeah. they're just chasing these fads. And it's nonsense. In fact, there's nothing better than a beautiful, crusty bread mm -hmm. enjoyed with an amazing meaty ragu cooked over a long Sunday of cooking in an Italian kitchen. When you dip into it with that crusty bread, it's mana from heaven. And you eat very little, but you feel very full and complete mm -hmm. because it's just what you needed for satiety. Similarly, a little bit of uh, uh, makkhan malai, you know, you when you yeah, yeah. lift that malai from the top of milk and keep storing it for a few days, put it on crusty or raw bread yeah. and with a little sprinkling of glamorera sugar that's crunchy, what you bite into is magic yeah. that no other cooking can give you. So these indulgences are rewards. They are a celebration. They connect you to good uh, comfort that makes you eat the veggies with greater hunger. Don't deny yourself. You said it in your opening remarks. Denial isn't necessary or essential. Mm -hmm. Celebrate your life, yourself, your cooking, the plethora of ingredients we uh, cook with and uh, cook deliciousness with. And when you do that, these indulgences are perfectly fine. When we are only eating uh, gluten or only eating bacon every day, yeah. then it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. But it's okay to eat it every Sunday for breakfast. What's the problem? It Enjoy balance. it. Yeah. If you're eating three meals of it every day, you're a crazy cook. <laughs> Just as you would be crazy eating uh, dosa in Italy every day, three meals yeah. a day, every day yeah. for seven days. So there's no, no harm in bacon yeah, if you I, eat it to enjoy once in a while. Yeah, I think it's in the balance. And, um, you know, you touched upon eating out. And uh, this is something I wanted to talk briefly about because you're a culinary director on restaurants and you work in the restaurant industry. But you might be able to relate to this, that there was a time I thought if I paid good money, I would get great healthy food. And today, money doesn't guarantee it, number one. Number two, even if I get something healthy, you know, if I buy a salad, the dressing has sugar in it. 
um, because they aren't using great quality ingredients. You know, the vegetables taste so bad, you have to mask it with something. Or if I get, recently I got a maida free bread, I turn it around, there's no maida in it, but there's added gluten in it, which, you know, to make it soft, which is worse than having maida bread. So how do I pick a healthy eating experience? So let's talk about that maida that you're talking mm. about. Maida made out of millet is no healthier than maida made out of wheat. Yeah. The act of making, making a flour, when you process a grain into a flour, mm-hmm. it's not a grain. It's mm-hmm. a flour. If you're counting calories, if you have diabetes, you're going to get that sugar crash eating maida, eating millet flour, eating all kinds of flours. Flours are bad for you in beyond moderation. So um, I think the conversation we need to have is that eating at home, eating at a restaurant doesn't guarantee uh, health, wellness, well-being. Or satiety. What you have to eat are foods that look like what nature meant them to be, that are growing in season, that are being paired with condiments and uh, garnishes that work together. And you can you can perhaps visit the farms uh, around the areas where you're eating them. These labels, organic, natural, mean nothing. You could be giving a chicken organic grain, but keeping it in a cage where it's pooping on itself or on the bird below, in the cage below, spreading salmonella, giving uh, steroids to beef it up, it's not good for you. Yeah. Don't chase yeah. labels. Be practical yeah. there as well. Yeah. well that's the I reason I tell go- people go to restaurants, yeah. no, no. go to restaurants to celebrate an occasion. Go to restaurants that's to... That's actually why mark- I called you here. Because once you told me that I tell my customers that, you know, go home, eat with your family. I thought, you know, that's such a unique approach. You must, uh, see, I'm the culinary director of perhaps the greatest restaurant existing in the planet today, Bastion at the top. Yeah. It's a huge, uh, lucrative success. It's a spectacle where quality of food matches the ambience, matches the vision that Ranjit Bindra, the founder, and Shilpa Shetty, the partner, uh, brought to their project. And the 48th floor Bom- Bombay views, 360 degree views. 40-foot ceilings, rainforest and swimming pool. A human being couldn't have imagined this. We've given it to our customers. It comes at a price. We deliver what we charge for. It's satiety for people at many levels. But who wants to do it every day? Enjoy it. But then get also the enjoyment of eating as a family with your uh, uh, friends and neighbors, with your loved ones at the table, being able to cry, sing, challenge one another, debate, argue. All of that. That's what the table gives you, which you can't do at a restaurant. You have to be polite. That is, you can't buy that in a public setting. So keep yeah. cooking at home. Give us chefs that gift of coming every now and then to our tables in a restaurant. But yeah. never lose that family connection that is built yeah. with food being served from a kitchen that's charged and flamed with love and a table where free conversations can flow, where humanity meets empathy means meets individuality and all of it is guarded with a sacrosanct belief in plurality. Yeah. You know, I I love talking with you because um, every time I hear you, it's a reinforcement that food is not just for physical health. It's so important for our social and emotional well-being as well. And this conversation has been very, very good for my mental and intellectual health. So thank you for sharing everything you have. Thank you. You're too kind. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yesterday for lunch, I had um, unpolished white rice. It was sourced from a farm in Assam. I had my own homemade ghee. And I had garlic podi, which comes from a shop in Chennai. It's a small shop and they make small batches of their powder. So it's also very transparent. And sometimes I feel that if price is not an indicator, I dig out the shop or the chef and I follow them on Instagram and I see what their philosophy is to food. And that that is more, um, it's, a, it's a higher chance that I'm going to get good food than just going by the price on the menu. And yesterday was a wonderful day. I had food in the sun. I live in a place with a lot of birds, so a very chatty little crow came and had a full conversation with me. And I got so happy that I ate very little. I got satiated very quickly. And today I lost 100 grams, eating everything that every online listicle will tell you not to have, carbs and fat. So, you know, it's something to learn from. 
And speaking of listicles, I just want to quickly point out that we were recently ranked as number two amongst the top 10 health podcasts in the country by Feedspot. And it's really encouraging to see positive feedback. If you enjoyed or learned something from this episode, please do rate us. We are available on Apple, Google and Spotify. And if you have something to share about your relationship with food, I would love to hear about your experiences. You can write to us at pods at indiatoday.com or on 8588 966 996.